why we are that way is because when we got off those boats, homosexuality was used as a way to break our spirits. And the trauma connected to acts of that nature when you were placed in front of the people that you cared about and were violated, of course, over the years, it's, I said this to my daughter, sometimes people forget why they hate something. Sometimes people forget why they love something. So they're so used to saying, I just love that, but they have no clue what the history is. The trauma that was done to us by those that enslaved us was such that homosexuality was such a vile thing that of course we're going to react to it, but you couldn't tell most men today why they react the way that they do. So to your question, masculinity is simply to understand that certain things that should be assigned to the way males or high testosterone figures should be and femininity should be, but it's so blurred that to me, I just simply say a man that is in touch with himself is a man that understands his masculinity and understands his femininity. Because for all the former players in the room, and if you still are a player, that's between you and the God you pray to, that is the fact that women respond to both. Women respond to both. The dude who's too hard, chicks don't bother with. The dude who's too soft, chicks don't bother with. The dude who understands how to emphatic, emphatically imply his softer side while still being somewhat tough. Women go, I like how in control of yourself you are. I like how smooth you are. So what's the first thing other men say? Well, that's that FAG stuff because it makes them uncomfortable because they can't do it or they don't like the results of it. We as men have to really simply sit down and start acting. Why do we use homosexuality as an insult? Well, it's because at one point we were all traumatized because of what was done to us in the ways that homosexuals express affection. But if you want to be honest with yourself, if you've never laid with a man, thought about being with a man, or did anything in that capacity, there's nothing about you homosexual. And I'm not about to allow society to get me to the point that I got to worry about what I'm eating to be considered homosexual. And, and these are the things that we have to have discussions with and be okay with, because you also have to look at the incarcer incarceration rates. You can't stick men in cells for things that they didn't do for years on years and then ask yourself, why do men take on certain behaviors? It, it, the two go hand in hand. And then at the same time, we're not talking about the trauma from that. So to your original question, bro, it's really just a simple understanding of what are the manly things about yourself, but you still have to embrace the feminine things about yourself. And neither one is wrong unless you lay too heavy on one or the other, which makes you uncomfortable. I don't worry about how uncomfortable other people are about me. What is wrong when I sit with somebody in a counseling session and they say to me, Brother Keith, is it wrong that I cry so much? Well, it all depends. What are you crying about? Is, is, is it a problem that I don't cry? Why do you feel you have to be so hard? And as we start to chop away, you know what we get at? Because the roles that were given to them weren't defined and it screwed them up inside here in their heart and here in their head. So just simply, it's a matter of how you see yourself as a man and the parts of you that are connected to your feminine side. Because how could we not be somewhat feminine or male when every part of male or woman was created from the same individual? We came from the dirt and then women were pulled from us. Well, how could a woman be pulled from us when God decided to do that if the parts of that female wasn't already in us? Because wouldn't he, God have just made another man? The Bible actually lays it out problem is we don't want to look at it that way so we want to make it what we want just stop and look at what the bible is saying god made us breathed into the dirt here we are in his image then said nope you can't be alone so i'm going to pull the woman from you so you can have a helpmate well whatever he pulled from me means that that had to be already in me but then he made me a partner, which is an extension of me. So that means the partner that God made me, some of that is already in me. So how can I avoid the feminine part if God took it from me? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so the idea is that these are the things that we have to look at. And then if we can start there, then we can start to create a situation where honest conversations, comfortable conversations can be had without a guy feeling uncomfortable. And if you've had homosexual situations, that's between you and the person you were with. We've started to extend to the point that a person can't feel comfortable with sharing their own truth. So to me, brother, it's just how you feel about yourself in a manly capacity, as well as how you feel about yourself in the capacities of things that you might consider feminine, because we do have testosterone and estrogen inside our bodies. Every man and every woman does. All right, Brother Keith, as always, man, bringing that fire going deep. Land, I see your hand up. Welcome, Brother John. Hey, Charles, man, I'm glad to see you, man. Glad to see you. Um, go ahead, Land. Oh, uh, yeah, I just had a quick question for Brother Keith. You know, I like picking your brain, man. You full of wisdom, Doc. Um, so one of the things that I noticed, like growing up playing sports, right, uh, we're talking about masculine and homosexuality. Um, if I was to explain celebrations to some men without telling them the story, they would say, oh, y'all gay. Mm-hmm. But then when they see it, you know what I'm saying? It's a whole different, you know, type of view. So, like, when you win a championship and you jump into another man's arms or when basketball, I used to see play, especially in the 90s, smacking each other butt in the 80s, smacking each other butt. Or oh, I've seen dudes, like, embrace each other and kiss each other and stuff like that, celebrate, especially in FIFA, when they run and they go like this and they jump in each other's arms and they start hugging each other and stuff mm-hmm. like this. Um, So why is this such a... Why, why is the mentality so different from the sports world versus our own communities, our own backyards? Well, look at the fact that our communities are closed-minded. So if we can't accept it, we ignore it. But often we only accept what we're limited to. And I tell this story all the time when I go out to speak. If all you ate was Chuck steak, Well, if somebody say, what's the best cut of steak? You're going to say Chuck's steak. It's all you were exposed to. So I take you to a restaurant and you get a ribeye or you get you you get any cut of steak that you want, a filet mignon, you get whatever you want, which is of quality. And you go, oh, my God, this this tastes incredible. Yes. This is what a better cut of meat tastes like. Now you got two choices. You can accept what you just tasted or you can completely ignore it and go back and tell the lie now that Chuck steak is the greatest steak. Well, now the question becomes, are you comfortable with what you just learned? And a lot of people are not. So they'll go back to the lie. And as I just said to you earlier, tell the lie long enough, people will forget where it ever originated and just simply keep saying to themselves, Chuck steak. I'll give you an example. How many people of color refuse to eat a steak that's rare, medium, medium rare? I'm not eating no steak that's bleeding. Because we've been taught to cook our food until it can't do anything, until it's rigid on the plate. Because for whatever reason, we equate any type of blood on the plate as something negative. When actually chefs from all around the world say the best way to prepare a steak is medium to medium rare. Because we're so used to the foods that we eat having to cook them to the point that there's no poison in them. That's just what's inside our heads. But when you take a brother and actually give him a medium, medium rare steak, and to get him to understand that, no, that is not blood. That is actually part of the steak when it's actually cooked. You're fine. They eat it and they taste it. You can actually see the struggle. You can actually see the struggle. Because, again, it's what you were exposed to, brother. Now, you talked about sports, myself included as a coach. I've coached international basketball. And the funny thing is, when I coached in the Caribbean, a lot of the brothers, because of how their finances was would sleep two, three in a room. So the woman who she owned a mansion in Smokyville in in, um, Kingston, when the men that were staying at the, at at her mansion, she had like one bed in the room. She had like seven, seven rooms. And I said, ma'am, I know this is going to sound crazy. American guys won't lay in the bed with another dude. She said, but they're just sleeping. So they're not going to do it. So she had to run out and buy a bunch of air mattresses for the guys to lay on. And we had that conversation over dinner. 
couple other coaches and myself. And she said, but I don't understand. The men are just sleeping. How come? Because she said, we sleep two, three to a bed. I said, and some of these young men in their neighborhoods back home in America do too, but not as athletes. Not going to do it. And I don't have time to kind of get into that mindset. If they got to focus on the game itself, we can't do that. So they bought them air matches. So the next day at practice, when we were sitting down and talking that morning, I said, why were some of y'all so uncomfortable? Because when they walked the room, first thing they saw was one bed. No, nah, I ain't sleeping with no other dude. And I said, why did you equate sleeping with sex? And all you heard was, nah, coach, I ain't trying to hear that, man. Y'all trying to make me gay. I said, who said that you had to go sleep with anybody? We just tried to get y'all somewhere to lay. All y'all got here to Jamaica didn't have to pay anything. So you think we brought you to Jamaica to try to change you into homosexuals? And here's what one of the kids said. So you were laying in bed with another dude, coach? No, if I'm getting a free trip to Jamaica and all I got to do, as long as my man lay on his side and I'm on mine, I'm good. I'm, I ain't stressing nothing. Nah, coach, that's suspect. Nah, coach, I don't play those games. Not where I come from. Where you come from? I'm from 40 projects in South Jamaica, Queens. Ain't no worse projects, so don't give me that you more harder than me. So stop it. But then I said, but I get it. I just wanted to know. I understood where it's coming from, but that's the thing, brother, is that it is what we're used to. Yeah, one hand there, one of the foot. There you go, Mike. But that's it's what we're used to, and it's also what we're trained because we've heard our mothers, if there was no father at home, let him be hard. Don't pick him up. You better not cry because the mother believed that she was grooming him to be a stronger man when in actuality she was grooming him to be less connected to his emotions. I always find it interesting that hardened church women would say, ain't no man supposed to cry. And I said, so when Jesus cried over Mary, what was that? And they all paused. Jesus was so moved by Mary's emotions about him not showing up for his brother Lazarus that he cried, and then he went out and performed a miracle. So please explain to me how you're teaching your son not to cry, but the very book that you swear by shows Jesus crying. So tell me how that works. So to answer your question is what we're trained, and then we repeat it, rinse and repeat it, because we don't challenge it, because we don't know to. And sometimes when we do, no one wants to be that lone dude. No one wants to be the dude on the outside, even with a team. And I've played and coached. Nobody wants to be that dude out on the outside of the squad unless you're the superstar. If you're the superstar, then you don't care because your idea is that they can do whatever. They still need me. But when it comes to homosexuality, dudes panic because you hear this word, the sanctity of the locker room. But all y'all walking around half butt naked anyway, so what's the problem? Because you worried that somebody might take a peek and that makes you uncomfortable. But let a chick go in there and everybody pulling their towels off. You don't care who see your beef now if a chick is in the locker room, so what's the difference? Oh, because the chick makes it okay. It's what we're trained, brother. So I hope that helps. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Brother Keith, for that. Sure. So, um, uh... Uh, let's see, Miles. Let's see, you got your hand raised, bro. Come on. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, guys brought up some really good points that I just thought about. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the AFC Championship game. I think when the defensive end Joseph Asai pushed Patrick Mahomes out of bounds and it caused like a 15 yard penalty mm -hmm. and put them in the field goal position and then won them the football game. Mm -hmm. And you, they showed the images after the, the, the Chiefs kicked the field goal of Asai sitting there mm -hmm. on the bench, bawling his eyes out because he, mm -hmm. in his, like he, he felt that he cost his team a chance at the Super Bowl again. And you saw several of his teammates walk past him. And there was like several, maybe a minute or two passed by where he was just sitting there on the sideline by himself. Coaches had left, other players had left. And it wasn't until one of his teammates came back and like consoled him. And like you were mentioning, um, too many times that we see a brother crying or uh, over, over a situation, whether a loved one has passed or they felt like they're, they're helpless or they caused some situation to hurt somebody. And we've been conditioned to, oh, yeah, he's soft. We don't want, we, I don't want to be associated with any of that. You know, he, he needs, you know, he needs to suck it up or whatever and, mm -hmm. and get over it. And it took one guy to go over there and tell him, no, it's okay. It's not your fault. 
you know, this, this is a game that happens. We've seen that so many times in baseball games and hockey games and football games where guys have made these plays that have, they felt like have cost their team the game, possibly a championship. And I mean, a lot, I think for a lot of the guys, like when they have situations like that, where before the game, they were all unified, you know, they were all a team. And then when something like that happens, now all of a sudden he's, that player's by himself. You know, no one wants to consult, no players, coaches, or anybody else wants to console them. So I think we have to, when we look at sports and we see teammates like Landell was saying about when guys celebrate and when guys win championships, I think a lot of people don't understand for people who played sports, the amount of sacrifice, the amount of work that it takes to get to those events and why those guys jump into each other's arms and are crying in each other's arms and hugging each other and all that stuff that we, you know, we usually don't see in public that I think, especially for black men, it feels like that's the only space for them allowed to show emotion is on the baseball field or the, the football field, where if they were in public, same athletes, if they were in public, oh, no, nah, I can't, it's suspect, man, I'm not going to hug you and stuff, but you were just hugging your teammate on the field. What's two days ago <laughs> crying your eyes out because you guys just won the Super Bowl so it's yes, sir. yeah it's it's one of those things where I think it's we see it's it's it, it, like I like I said I have a three-year-old and I'm making sure when he cries and he has issues I'm not trying to tell him hey stop crying I'm like hey what's wrong tell me what's Thank wrong you. with you Thank you, you know like I'm not gonna make not gonna too many times that we've seen it look even my my dad he grew up in a different area he did the same kind of thing with us but um where it was, you know, you didn't really talk about your emotion. You know, you just, if you were, if you were a man and you had something going on, you didn't tell the wife, you didn't tell the kids what was going on. And that kind of has been passed on that trauma where it's like, you know, they said, I think they said the this male suicide, men's suicide since the pandemic have like skyrocketed um, yes. because of the, like you said, you were talking about the gender roles where, you know, um, we're in a, we're in a, in a society now where there are several, there are a lot of, there are more college educated black women. Now that there are black men in college, um, they're making more money. So we've been taught for the last 40, 50 years, you know, if you, if you don't, if you're a man, you're not making any money or providing for your household financially, then you're not a man. So you got a lot of guys struggling with like their own identity of how do I provide if I'm not, if my wife or girlfriend whatever is making more money than me. So yeah, a lot of guys like, you know, taking themselves out because they feel like they can't provide in that, in that uh, space. So it's, we have to condition ourselves to like, it's, it's going to take some time, but to get to a point where understanding that, like you said, like Jesus displayed all these emotions in the Bible, all these emotions, but yet when we want to put it into practice in our own communities, we, we, we say that it's, it's not manly. When Jesus was the one doing doing that, you know, he like he, he did it all. I mean, he, cried, he was praying in the garden. He was crying. I mean, blood was coming out of his of his, of his hair. So I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's it's like you said, it's it's condi- one of those conditions, right? It's it's been beaten or broken out of us to a point where it's not acceptable. Um, even I think you mentioned like during slave times when. When uh, when they when they re- when they were under when they couldn't they couldn't understand a language when they understood what was going on, they would have they couldn't hug the wife that they had because if they found out they were together they would split them apart. Mm-hmm. So they had to show some sort of you know the, um, disassociation with the, with their wife when they realized oh they they just split so and so up I can't no, don't hug me you know don't bring the kid around me. So even with even on the plantation they would have to go hide in secret with their family because if they found out they were together they would split them apart immediately so i think part of that's been conditioned to us too where we don't show love to our wives and you know hugging our kids or kissing our kids on the head and stuff like that because it's been conditioned for us men to not show that kind of emotion so i think it's hopefully we're getting to a different place and and understanding that emotions are just part of you and it's learning how to understand those emotions and then how to process those emotions the right way instead of immediately going off and saying something negative no doubt no doubt uh, well thank you brother miles for that man you know um yeah it, the condition um and i was just talking about that earlier 
and Lando set me straight, man, on, um, you know, my son, uh, you know, he's special needs. And one of the things that he has a challenge with is uh, stranger danger and recognizing, you know, good people and bad people. OK, you know, so uh, we, we can recognize and we can see it, but he doesn't see that. And so I'm on constant teach mode to get him to recognize these things in repetition because he doesn't have the capacity at this stage, you know, to understand that. So, you know, we're in a barbershop in the hood uh, and he wants to give me a hug. And I kind of told him, no, not right now. This is not the place. Um, doing that, not in a sense where I was, you know, saying that because I've given him hugs before in, in a lot of different places, but I need him to understand that when you show your card, when you show in predators, you know, certain things they pick up on, they know that they can take advantage of. You. And that's where my mindset was on that. But I appreciate what Lando said, um, because I could have done that and have set a, uh, a different uh, um, standard, you know, for other men to see that they probably have not been exposed to that. So, um, yeah, definitely. So, Brother Greg, I see you got your hand up, man. Come on, what you got? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I got a question for Brother Keith. Uh, so, um, so, so I'm, so I'm you know, divorced and kind of back on the dating scene. That's, uh, I've had this conversation with women um, reg with regards to how men approach dating and how w women approach dating. I think women kind of, you know, they kind of date serially, like meaning one man at a time, whereas guys, we kind of date multiple women at a time. Or we date, like, now, not to say that we sleeping with all of them, but we date differently. So, but I, but I want to turn that to womanize. You know, what your your thoughts on womanizing? Like, why, why that is so prominent in the man community, in the black male community, or black community? But more importantly, how do you? Because I think one time when you in the last conversation you talked about that, that even you was a womanizer at one point. But how do you break that cycle? <laughs> Great. I appreciate you, brother. Well, first and foremost, you're 100% right. Women do serial date because they date to date. Men date to hump. So don't get it twisted. We don't date to date. That's why when a woman goes, I date often, we go, damn, because we're thinking she humping. So that's one of the first things. We see it differently. Um, the womanizing comes because we are the extension of our penis. And we lead with that more than we'd like to believe. Case in point. When we show up with our boys and we say we just met a nice woman, we then explain her body parts. We then explain how she look because we want acceptance to what you were able to bag, what you were able to secure because it is the trophy mindset. Because we want acceptance from our brothers to be like, yo, you should, yo, she's, yo, she all that before anything else, because again, it's it's the extension of the conquering, the getting, and the womanizing is because we take pride in that, because we get adulation, not just self-adulation, we get adulation from the people in our circles. The crazy part, and, and to your point of how do you deal with that, look at your circles. Do you know that when your circles change, your behavior changes? If everybody in your circle say is married or in healthy relationships, right? And you bust through the door and be like, yo, I just ran through three, four chicks. If all the men turn around and be like, what's wrong with you? What is that? You know what happens? You automatically check yourself. And all it do is all it takes is a couple dudes to be like, fam, we don't treat women like that. What's wrong with you? Now the conversation in the door is open because either you're going to stay and change or you're going to find another circle that's going to help feed whatever it is about yourself. But a lot of it is who we surround ourselves with, because whether we want to believe it or not, as men of color, we're in a consistent state of trauma. We're in a consistent state of negativity where many of us have never seen a healthy relationship. Many of us have never experienced what healthy relationship between male and female look like. And some, because of financial restrictions, when we did have mom and dad, one, if not both, had to work so much that we very we had very limited amount of family interaction 
to be able to experience that. So those of us who are trying to take care of our children, we got to be like right now tonight, I had to tell my daughter, look, I, I really want to jump on this call and I'm going to get back to you. And she's like, all right, cool. But I got her approval because today's her day. And I was like, all right, cool. Because I really wanted to have this conversation, but that's just how I extend myself to my daughter. So she understands this is what daddy does, but I'm not neglecting you because, you know, Saturday, we good. We got everything that you want to do Saturday. It's your birthday, but we're really going to celebrate it on Saturday. And that communication is what's necessary, brother Greg. Now, the way I stopped womanizing, simply, I heard God's voice. My unhappiness led me to a position that I was broken. And when God spoke to me at that stage, the thing that I had to do was go fix home. Because to be broken and then take that brokenness into your home, you're breaking everything around you. And as I talk about it, even wrote about it, I had pushed a good woman to a bad place. Well, I'd already failed in one marriage. And here I'm messing up with the new relationship and she's shown herself to be great. She done caught me cheating three times. How much more can she take? So at that point, I had to realize I needed to get me straight. But the reason why I was able to do that was because of the Lord, but also because my wife never allowed herself to get caught up in my mess. She talks about it often. Whatever Keith was dealing with, that's his business. But I ain't getting into it because if he's going to be with me, he had to come here. A lot of sisters, because they see our brokenness, they start to lower the bar. You lower the bar to a wolf, what are you going to do? So what a lot of sisters don't know is you have to hold that bar here. Force him to fix him. And if he can't, cut him loose. I don't care what you see and feel in him, cut him loose. We as men who happen to be healed have to help younger and older brothers understand you can't be the wolf, bro. And then try to sell yourself as the shepherd. Can't do it. So we have to take on the mantle of shepherd so much so that not only do we become it, we start to demand it from everybody around us. You then surround yourself with the solid folks. Things change. I think it's 1 Corinthians 13. Help me out, Brother Landel. Bad communication affects good manners. 13.10, I think it is. Depending on which version of the Bible that you read, it'll say good company, bad company affects good communication or good company affects good manners. All it's really saying is the people that you surround yourself affect how you move. That's how you change yourself, brother. One, reconnect yourself with God to understand it's okay to change. Two, connect yourself with somebody, preferably a female who loves you, because this way she can pour into you from a position that you can't. And then three is surround yourself with brothers who are going to hold you up and hold you accountable. Jesus didn't need disciples. Let me just say this to everybody listening. Jesus didn't need disciples. He chose them for us. Think about it. He was God in man's form. Why does he need 12? Why does he need a street team? He didn't. The street team was for us. The street team was for us to pick one of those 12 that we can identify with and move ourselves into position to want better. Jesus is the lead singer, but all 12 standing behind him playing. It was earth, wind, and fire before it was earth, wind, and fire. But the lead singer was to get your attention to show you what it looked like, but you were supposed to choose. You know, I think I want to be Philip Bailey. I think I want to be the guitarist. You know, and I think Maurice White is doing his thing. I, I want to be the bald headed dude with no shirt. I want to be him. Okay, whoever you want to be, Jesus put that in place for you because you're still part of the squad. We only hear about some of them, but if you're really studying, all 12 presented something that you could find yourself in. That is why when, when, when Peter came back to talk to Paul, he said, the one you walked with, he had to remind him, the one you walked with, because you leading all the men in the wrong direction. I'm here because of the one you walked. So you can't fight with me, or argue with me. That's how you change your situation. God, a woman that you can count on and, and surround yourself with solid brothers, your life has to change. That's, that's good feedback. I appreciate that. No, I appreciate you. Yes, yes. I want. Can I? Man. I want to say yeah. something, um, Rick. Mm -hmm. And it goes yeah. back to what Brother Miles was saying, right? And what sports allows us to show emotion, also armed services, right? Check this out, because we can't take slavery off the table. We can't. You cannot take three, four hundred years of massive trauma 
and think we're going to be okay. We've been, we haven't been free as long as we were in bondage. So we don't, the, the years don't even add up right now. We got free in 1865. We've been, we were slaves longer than we've been free. So we haven't had a chance to balance out the trauma. I'm, my great grandmother's grandmother was a slave. So I sat at my great grandmother's feet, which means I was only two generations away from a slave. Well, there's maybe been 10, 12 generations that was slaves. So if, if that's the case, they didn't have a chance to heal. I'm the, the one with all the college degrees and everything else. So if I'm the first one that got all these degrees and everything else, what, what, what were they going on? Scripture and whatever else they could put together. So we haven't been free long enough to truly understand how to help ourselves. So those that were in power, you want to call the ones that enslaved us, you want to call them colonizers, whatever name you want to put on them. Sports and armed services. Did they allow us to show emotion because they benefited from that? They did not want us showing emotion to anything that benefited us. You see it now. The reason why CRT is not discussed doesn't benefit them. It would benefit us. And the fear has always been, if you allow the enslaved to become knowledgeable about who they are and could be, we can't control them. That is why they broke the men. By breaking the men, their families automatically acquiesced. We have no protection. But somehow through all that abuse and all that trauma, we kept getting married. We kept having babies. We kept our lines going, even when they were being infiltrated, even when folks were being snatched up, even when families were being broken by just smiling and kissing each other. Somehow we were still able to stay together. But you cannot get away from the emotional cruelty that was put into place and not ask yourself, what is the long-term damage to what that does to us? And that's the thing that's not being discussed and it's not being discussed in church. Brother Rick, I tell you this all the time. My job when I come to churches is to try to create mental health ministries because we talk about scripture, but we're not applying scripture in a way to be able to show that the greatest therapist that ever walked this planet was Jesus. Jesus actually practiced HIPAA. Most of y'all don't pay attention to that. I'll show you. I'm going to show you that Jesus actually practiced HIPAA before HIPAA was a thing. When Mary was about to be stoned, the men lined up ready to hit her with rocks. Y'all agree? Anybody argue with that? Nobody? Okay. Jesus said, hold on. Okay. Y'all want to hit her with rocks? Cool. Jesus actually was, was down with it. Like, hey, if y'all this, if this what y'all going to do to her, cool. He said, but hold on a second. Let any one of you that has no sin throw the first rock. Now, here's where Jesus practiced HIPAA. When he drew in the dirt, it says that each man looked down into the dirt, saw their sins, dropped their rock, and left. Now, here's where Jesus was fantastic as a therapist. Each person saw only their sin. Nobody else looked down and saw what Landel did. No one looked down and saw what Keith did. No one looked down and saw what Rick did. No one looked down and saw what Greg did. Only you saw what you did. So even in the midst of you about to stone a woman, Jesus said, I'm going to protect you. And then said, if this is what you want to do, and you say the law says it, so even Jesus was showing you, I don't break no laws. So if I'm wrong, stone her. And when each man looked down and said, oh, you was humping a sheep two weeks ago. Oh, you got 14 chicks around the corner, bro. Oh, you, you, you've been robbing everybody in your church. Okay, I'm out. Because And I guarantee you, whatever he showed them was things that nobody was supposed to know. Why they all got off their square so quickly? But a real therapist understands, I still got to protect you. I still have to make sure that the people around you don't now want to crucify you. And then he turns to the woman and says, see, you're fine. But don't sin no more. Because basically, I ain't going to be here with the cape on to help you. I already did that. That's what a good counselor, a good therapist does. He takes every consideration into place, makes sure that something is offered and that everybody's information is protected. The reason why you won't hear that in church is because a pastor doesn't have time to teach that. He doesn't have time to unpack that. So when you have questions, you can't get a Q&A in the middle of Sunday service. And because we're not demanding that everybody comes to Bible study to actually have what you guys are doing right here, that goes amiss. So we read the story, but we can't imply the story to how we live. 
So now ask yourself the question, how many times has a brother ran down a sister in our circles and we haven't quietly pulled them to the side and said, fam, stop that. Don't do that. To not embarrass them in front of the brothers, but also to treat the woman with respect in a respectful way. I just wanted to share that. Well, thank you, Brother Keith, as always, man. Like I say, you, you bring the clarity and you bring the fire. So, uh, Lando, see you got your hand up, man. You, uh, you got a question? Yeah, I did. It was for Brother Keith. Um, Brother Miles brought us something interesting that um, kind of triggered me. He brought the word conditions. Um, and how men tend to react in certain conditions. And when you was talking about Jesus, it triggered as well, was that uh, one of the conditions that I saw them a lot working in the jails for all those years was the difference between prevention and reaction. Yes, and how Jesus was trying so much to teach the disciples uh, the concept of prevention. You know, stay awake a little bit while I go pray. <laughs> yes, sir. I got to keep repeating myself. You know, oh, ye of little faith, while the storm was brewing on the ship, I got, I'm trying to prevent this from you from panicking. Stop yeah. panicking. It's like, even when the little boy had to break out and the disciples didn't know what to do, they couldn't do it. And you just like, I taught you what to do. You couldn't deliver this boy. You couldn't. So it was like, a, uh, it was, he was trying to teach the condition of prevention. While I struggled working in that facility, I've been, I grew up in church my whole life. Mm hmm I never heard the three words, I love you more working in that jail than I did in church, even in my own family and all that. And, and it was sad because it would, it would frustrate me because we can prevent a lot of this stuff from happening if we do show love or we do don't try to be so, oh, I'm masculine. Oh, you know, I, I miss a misinterpretation of what masculinity is, right? And we're so busy reacting to stuff that now that he got 120 years, now that he got 200 years, now he looking at 50 years, now was man, I love you. Tell the family, send my love and stuff like that and kiss the wife for me, kiss the baby for me. We start talking differently because the conditions change. Yep. And, and that really bothers me a lot. And it used to bother me. I used to get into discussion with inmates. I'll be honest, I got into arguments with a, with a <laughs> lot of them because they used to really make me mad when they came to my unit because I ran the hole. I used to really get into it with them. Mm -hmm. Because there's some of their dumb decisions could have been prevented if they just made smarter moves. Yes, sir. And so for, for my question to you is, how do you teach a community how to prepare better when they don't know or unaware of certain conditions? So like, well, my generation, it's hard to teach us um it's hard to teach us certain things that happened during the slavery time because we don't fully understand the conditions. Mm -hmm. It's hard to teach the generation after me the the what what it meant to protest and the significance of it because to them, Dr. King is Paul Bunyan. They they don't know if he's oh, yeah. real or not. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So how do you how do you how do you teach this this condition of preventing things before reacting to them to uh, you know to our people? Oh, I got you. Win. I got you. First thing is we're going we gonna to take off the table, brother, the language of you can't teach. Stop saying that. Remember, what you speak manifests into actual thing. Stop saying you can't teach. You've already defeated yourself before you opened your mouth. So we're not going to do that because if you say you can't teach, then secretly in your brain, you're going to not push as hard as you could when trying to reach a brother that gives you um situation. Now, I'm going to show you that you've already seen it without thinking about it. Greg said, I remember you saying, and then he asked the question. Well, if I had never said, Greg wasn't in a position to hear it, and it wouldn't have triggered something when he heard it tonight. So the teaching to any age group is by using transparency. Case in point, Brother Lander, when you walked into the prison, right, you seen some brothers that was defeated, correct? But you also seen one or two brothers who you can see a light in their eyes. And, and a part of you said, if I could only reach them before, right. they wouldn't be here, right? If I'm hearing you correctly, right? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. So there's some things that's going on in your life that you could pretty much share with some brothers who haven't gotten there yet to be able to explain to them what that light looks like on and off, right? Okay, well, there's your lesson to teach. 
Nice. Here's your content. Hey, that's good. To whatever age group you're talking to, the one thing that can never be argued is your life experience. So when you take your life experience and turn it into something that's palatable, if I serve food and I try to jam it all in your mouth, you're not going to enjoy it. I don't care who you are. But if I serve you small bits and pieces of it, allow you to savor it, allow you to taste it, allow you to go, hey, this is pretty good. Can I get some more? Sure. But I first have to be transparent. Brother Landel, I'm going to share with you something that I think tastes tremendous. Tell me what you think. And then if I give you the history of it as I'm giving it to you, because when I first tried it, man, let me tell you something. I, it looked funky, but I tried. But then I try. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to gauge you. You tell me. Well, now I set the table for you to try it. I've made it okay for you to like it, not like it, whatever. So to your point, you can teach anybody. The 23 years that I taught in New York City, I'm with kids in the hood. So one of the first thing I had to make them and help them understand is that I am a project kid. You don't sound like a project kid. First mistake. What's the project kid sound like? You've already accepted the negative. I just told you I'm a project kid. So are you now telling me I'm not? Or are you now telling me I don't sound like the project kids you're used to? Well, now let's talk. So by being transparent, by me saying I was a whore, by me saying I've been with over 400 women, by me saying I have seven children with six different women, judge me the way you choose. My truth is my truth. But here's the question, just like Peter, Paul, excuse me. You could judge who I was, or you can ask me how God got me here. Your choice. Which one? Because transparency is always the way that you get anyone to challenge you or question you. But either way, we're going we gonna to learn. And if I'm comfortable with discussing me and I have a way to show you how I got there, You'll take whatever you need. Remember, they say, what, chew the meat and spit out the bone? Well, what's that connected to? Meaning offer, and whatever person does with it, it's on them. All Jesus ever did was offer. You had to accept. And I, I'm going to give you something. You mentioned the story you were talking about, them not being able to handle the spirit, right? That's Mark 9. I used it all the time. If all y'all got the chance, and you don't have to do it right now, but go to Mark 9, read the whole thing. But I just want you to go to Mark 9, and I want you to go to verse 21. We're going to go 21, 22, 23. I'm not going to give you the whole thing tonight. I'm not going to waste your time. Not waste time, but I'm not going to take that much time. I want you to go through this. Mark 9, 21, 22, and 23, and 24, actually. And I'm going to show you not only how Jesus does it, but I'm going to show you how you can reach some of the brothers and sisters around you. So like Brother Lando was saying, when Jesus showed up, they were struggling with the demon. The uh, disciples was in a bad way, could not figure out how to get rid of this demon. And the father was like, yo, I brought him to you, your mans. And they was horrible with it. Like, who are these people? And then Jesus was mad at them. If you go back and read earlier, Jesus actually barked on his own disciples, which if you pay attention to Jesus, he is routinely getting at his people. And so I'm just going to focus on 21, 22, 23, and 24. Okay. So Jesus says, he asked the father, how long has, has this been happening to him? And he says, from childhood, meaning the father, and often he was thrown into both into the, he was, he was thrown into both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe all things are possible for him who believes, immediately the father cries out and says with tears, Lord, I believe, help me, help my unbelief. Now, in this little piece here, the reason why I use this right here, he asked the father, now, now go with me on this, pay attention. He asked the father, how long has he been going through this? You know why? Jesus already knows. He's getting the father to accept where he's going with it. Jesus knows everything. He's asking, so you got to come clean with it. And he'd been like this from childhood. And if you watch in verse 22, the father is asking for pity. If you can do anything, Jesus goes, no, 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 no. That ain't how we rock. You want me to help you, bro. You got to be ready. You got to bring it. You got to be something different. If you can believe, all things are possible for him who believes. So I need you there first before we do anything. So this is why every man should focus on 24. 
immediately the father cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but please help me not to go backwards. So Greg, to your question of how do I get away from certain behaviors, it is because immediately you stand on what God told you to do. And then your prayers are, please don't let me go backwards, but stand on what you were told to do. Most of us don't do that. And we don't hold the men around us that way when it's actually there. And if you really want to drop down again, I would read the whole thing. Like I said, I could teach a whole priest on it. But if you go down to 29, because I normally use verses 14 to 29 of, of Mark 9, right? But if you go down to 29, 28 and 29, I'm going to show you how smooth Jesus was. When he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast it out, meaning the demon? And here's Jesus. So he says to them, this kind can only come out by, by nothing but prayer and fasting. You see, they thought they had to go hands-on. They thought they had to interact with the demon directly. They thought we could try to force this demon out. And Jesus said, the reason why you screwed up was the fact that you didn't go talk to God and you didn't fast. So how many of us struggle with demons, struggle with issues, struggle with problems, and all we really have to do is turn to God privately and fast and pray instead of struggling with it hands on? And if you read the whole, if you start at 14 and read the 29, you'll see that when Jesus showed up, he saw a commotion going on, which means here's the disciples out there struggling. And the reason why it's kept vague is for us. Whatever the demon is to you is what you attach to this story. But many of us are like the father. Can I just get a little bit, God? If you just take some of this weight off me, that's why I stroked the brother Lando and said, no, we don't say you can't teach him. That just means I got to find a new way to reach him. Well, transparency is always the way. What do we say? Just be real with me, brother. Just keep it real with me. But you can't keep it real with yourself. You're not being honest with yourself. So what I do in counseling sessions, especially with men, I'll get your brother. You, you count. I know you counsel women. You counsel men. All depends. Are you ready to be counseled? Jesus asks questions he already know the answer to. But the reason why he asks, he wants you to check your ego. Many of us, it is the ego that prevents us from the healing. You know why? Look at Peter. Amongst everything Peter saw, what was he worried about that last week? Which one of us is the greatest amongst you? That's what you worried about, bro? We, <laughs> this what you worried about? And that's why Jesus said, man, please, by the end of the night, you're going to flip on me. So I hope that answers, Brother Lando. Good, 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 good. Thank you, Brother Keith, as always, man. Sure. You made me have to bring my glasses out, man. So um, <laughs> I had to get reading here. So I appreciate you, man. Like Listen. I said, love you, love you, love you. Yeah, man. I'm going to bring it when y'all show. When you ask me, I'm going to come, man. You know, if I'm coming, I got to bring Yo, something. I know, man. You always bless us, man. So, Miles, before you go, I know most of y'all know my man, Brother Keith, K.L. Belvin. But if you can give him a quick intro to who you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, which if they haven't already picked up, I got you know, you. on it, but. I am, well, you guys, I've been here a couple of times, but I am a crisis specialist, human service counselor. Um, what I do is I help people who are in crisis, who are going through different things. I am also a real Christian teacher. I am an Ephesian 4 teacher. I am an Ephesian 4 educational minister where most people call themselves prophets, call themselves pastors, call themselves evangelists, call themselves disciples, but you notice they always stray away from calling themselves teachers because when you call yourself teacher, you got to put up a shut up at that moment. And God already said, I'm going to punish the teachers harshly if they're out here giving the wrong information. Well, I'm a real Ephesians 4 teacher. I lean into it. I rest on it. And I help churches set up mental health ministries because I believe the church is misrepresenting the faith because they're supposed to make sure that the renewing of the mind is done through the church by getting people who can actually help with that and they're supposed to pay for it and so that's what i do and and professionally i'm trying to save brothers and sisters trying to save relationships and personally i'm a person that uses my own transition as a way to try to help brothers and sisters see that there is no there is no such thing as you can't change. And it drives me crazy when I hear people say it. And brother Rick and I have traveled in the same business circles and have now become friends. And I've done some business with the church in the past. 
And I'm simply here to try to present an avenue to healing, a pathway. As you hear, you'll see me post on a lot of my pages that healing requires a pathway. That's my, my mantra because often the, the biggest problem that brothers have when I do work with brothers, and I work with a lot, is that they feel uncomfortable with whatever's wrong. My job is to help you feel comfortable with whatever's wrong. And then together, we figure out a way for you to make changes, not for me to change you. My job is just to travel with you as you figure you out to either hold the rock up while you take a deep breath, because I can't move it forward. You have to, or hold the mirror up to show you that you're not doing what you say you're doing. As the kids say, it's all a cap. And if you out here capping, my job is to be like, nah, bro, that sound good, but you're not doing nothing. So I'm an accountability brother as well. And this is what I bring to the table. I have two master's degrees, one in education, uh, curriculum writing, assessment, and teaching. I taught for 23 years in New York City school system, as well as I was a dean of students. And I have a master's degree in human service counseling, specializing in Christian ministry. So I come to the table with receipts. But the biggest thing is it's not about me. Um, God saved my life 18 years ago by showing me that if I didn't fix home, I was going to hell. And um, I needed to get closer to him and get closer to my wife. And this run, the last 18 years, is my way of trying to give back. Because for 37 years, I was out here as nasty as anybody could get. I was a misogynistic whore. And panties was my God. And I was very good. And I was at the temple every week. And I've been with over 400-something women. And I've been a part of 25 or 26 abortions and miscarriages. And that's the ones I know about. Lord knows all the rest. And part of the reason why I was so hypersexual is one, I was sexually abused when I was six or seven around that time from a cousin. And then also what it was, was that I didn't realize that the trauma that I was suffering, I literally was trying to kill myself, but in, a, in an inadvertent way, meaning that I knew the things that I was doing was dangerous. So if I had died, I was okay with it because I never addressed my trauma. And part of the ways that I did that was by addressing the things that was wrong and how I was trying to create that pain in the people that I was dealing with. So now I use myself as a way. That's why Jesus said, give your testimony. That's why Jesus said, write it, write the vision and give it. People need to hear it and see it so they can attach it to themselves and then be able to make changes. So that's who I am. That's what I do. And anytime Brother Rick need me, like he says, he calls me out of the bullpen. I don't take long to warm up. I'm good. I'm throwing heat. By the time I get on the, on the bullpen, so I'm the Mariana Rivera of this thing. So you call me, I'm ready. I'm closing. That's what I do, brother Miles. If you have something for me, I got you. And I saw your your, your thing in the in on the in the thing on Willie Lynch. It's actually, a good interesting conversation. It's about mental conditioning. Is more what Willie Lynch is more about than anything else. Yeah, I was just gonna comment on like you said with Jesus being like the all-time best therapist and then didn't really think about you know that scripture when you know the one the first thing they tell especially people struggling from addiction the first thing they tell them the, the road to success is admitting that you have the problem exactly i can tell you and all your family can tell you everybody else around can tell you that you're having a problem but until you admit that the problem relies within you and yours in your household or wherever that may be until that happens, the solution can't come forward. Amen. Just reading that scripture, realizing that Jesus basically telling him, you know, I'm not going to sit here for, I don't know how many days guiding you through this. Like, I'm going to need you to understand you got an issue here because I got other cities. I got other people I, need to, I need to preach to. Come you on. have to handle this. Come on. And I think that's the a big part of, um, I think also in uh, the black community for men as well, whole, like you said, holding having that that circle around you though that that group uh whether it be family or friends that you know guys you can go to where if you if you messed up they will call you out they will let you know hey you need to you need to fix this mm -hmm. you know let you know you're going down the wrong path or you're going down um the wrong way so i yeah that was just yeah i didn't realize i didn't think of that scripture that way but that was a really great actually, way of the funny thing is and i appreciate you saying that jesus is actually the greatest teacher the greatest therapist, the greatest brother, because actually we call him perfect, but we don't analyze how he's perfect. And so if you really think about it, everything that you could ever need as a person, Jesus exemplifies in how he moves. That should by itself tip folks off that this has to be God breathed because 
unless there's some author that we don't know about out here writing incredible stories under a pseudonym, who could create a character that touches on something that everybody deals with? Everybody. And no one stops and thinks about that. So that's why I don't get into arguments about hey, who wrote the Bible. You know, white men wrote the Bible. Yes, then how come they're scared to change the words? And how come they preach it in their own churches if they wrote it? How come they don't change it? So stop. Look at it for what it is. Look at it how it can be used, a tool. Timothy said we're not even supposed to be using it to argue. It's a guide. And if you really allow it to guide you, your life changes because all you have to stop and say is, well, let me see what happens if I apply this. And to your point, Miles, if you go back to what I said, and I love to use Mark 9, 14 to 29, because in verse 17, um, actually verse 19, Jesus said to him, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to me. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit started convulsing and fell in the ground and started wallowing, foaming at the mouth. Here's the funny thing about that verse, right? Jesus didn't address the, the, the spirit until he was ready to go to work. He didn't address the evil. He addressed his own. He addressed the father didn't address the crowd. And once he had everybody in the position that he needed them in, all right, come on about it here. Get out. The spirit didn't even fight him. It yelled and screamed and came on out. So you know what the spirit did? It tried to slam the child. It tried to lay the child out like the child was dead. It said the child laid there stiff that everybody thought he was dead. Jesus said, come on, get up. And then he got up. So he still didn't address the spirit after he said what he said. There's something to be taught there. Many of us spend hours debating with the evil, debating with the, the problem. I ain't got no money. Yo, I can't, I'm not working. Yo, my girl left me. Yo, my boys don't care. Stop. Speak to the things that you need. Speak to what it is that you want. And it gets your ass to work. Once you spoke to the demon, don't say nothing else. Jesus didn't even speak to the demon. When homeboy brought him over, the demon's there. He's talking to the father, which means he's holding a possessed child. And he's like, how long he been like this? Oh, his whole life, you know, he throws him in the fire. He throws him in the water. And, you know, he tries to kill him. Really? But if you could just help us, we, we would have preached. There's a possessed child in his possession. But Jesus goes, no, 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 no. no. We, what's this pity thing? Bro, you got to believe you want me to do something with this. He's testing the father. Why? Because when I go, you better be geared up and ready if this comes back. And how do we know it comes back? Well, this is where scripture starts in scripture. When Jesus had his weakness and the devil came, what happened? Took him through a series of events, right? What do we see at the end of that scripture that says the devil left for this season? He knew he was coming back to take more shots at him. Jesus knew that. But right now, nah, even in my weakened state, you can't get me. So we're supposed to see that and go, then if Jesus is the example, how many of us are standing firm against the demons in our lives the same way? And if we have doubts on how to do that, go down to 29 where he tells his disciples, you know why you struggle? Because all you had to do was pray and fast. That's something our grandmothers told us. Greatest teacher on the planet. Because our elders had already told us. What's one of the first things all of us who had grandmothers in the church? Did you fast, boy? You know, if you take a break and just don't eat and if you just just shut and give God a chance to speak to you and we hear it, we nod our head and we go out and get something to eat and still fret about what's wrong. The Bible is filled with tactical ways to get your emotions under control to then allow your physical presence to change while staying connected to your spiritual foundation. And what is optimal health? Solid physical, mental and emotional, spiritual. That triangle is optimal health. When your body, mind, and spirit are in one, it is hard for anything to pierce that. Jesus is the example of that. And this is what we have to share with each other. But we don't. And here's the funny part. The enemy, and I, and I hate to brush it with a, with a brush of color. Those that enslaved us, some were black too. They understood the power of the unity of family. Because when a brother has his family in tow, he can attack anything. He can stand up against anything. And it wasn't just slavery. Mega Evers, Malcolm X, 
Martin Luther King, all sacrificed for the idea of men of color, women of color being treated fairly. Here's the part that nobody talks about. All these men were out risking their lives, right? We agree? Where all these babies come from. All of them had multiple babies. So they chose strong women. All three women went on to successful careers after their man was assassinated. And all of them had multiple children who were doing well, except for Malcolm X's daughter. It was actually his grandson that killed his grandmother because he set the apartment on fire. But the idea is when you look at the power of a powerful union and the kids created from it, they could overcome the assassination of the man in the family. That is the power that the evil ones understood early. So off the boats, they had to break us apart. And to, the, to Miles' point about the Willie Lynch letter, it's about emotional conditioning. If I convince them to enslave themselves, I can just lay back in the cut and chill. How do we know this to be true? What do pimps talk about on a regular? I am going to convince her to stand out on this corner, do things that are vile to men she doesn't know, and then turn around and hand me the money and call me daddy. Well, if that's not Willie Lynch, what is it? And that's the key. We hold the keys to the transition of the things we want to see. We hold the keys to the changes we want to see. But first, we have to understand what it is that we're trying to change into. How do we then know what to surround ourselves with? So to every man on here, I would challenge you and say, do you understand what it is that you are, what it is that you want, and are you on the road to it? The, the, your dreams may be all behind you, but you keep staring in this direction and mad that this whole thing is dark, but here's a whole city of lights behind you, but you won't turn around because you actually haven't stopped and said, I wonder if this, oh, wow, well, look. So that's the challenge. Brother Miles, and I gotta get ready to jump off a little bit so I can go hang out with my daughter for a little no, bit. No, it was when you were talking and it just brought up another thing. I remember even in the Black, the Black Panther movie, the first one, where T'Challa sees his father in the afterlife and he's crossed the, becoming the Black Panther. And he's become king and he's like, I don't know how to handle this. He's like, I don't know if I can become, be a good king. And his father told him, a man, a man that has not prepared his children for his death has failed as a parent. Thank you. And I was like, I thought that was like, I always like resonated with that line. It's like, you, you don't know when your time is up. Exactly. But you have to make sure that your family and your line continues exactly. on and strives forward. So I don't think exactly. you brought that up. I just kind of go a little it. deeper, Miles. What else did his father say? I wasn't a good king. Yeah. And he said that because sometimes a king is going to do something that's completely 100 percent wrong. Mm -hmm. But T'Challa was an honorable dude. So his whole problem was we created Killmonger. How could you do that and sell us on you being great mm -hmm. when you knew what you did? Right. You killed your, you killed your brother mm -hmm. and left your nephew out here knowing that, then came back and sold us a bad bill of goods about honor and everything else when the whole time you were filthy. Right. And I had to become king through your death to understand what's going on. So we created Killmonger. And the reason why so many people identify with Killmonger, because if you really listen to what he's saying, he's not wrong. He's the other version of every black man on this planet. Well, if we got it, then we should just go to war with it. And T'Challa was like, hold on, bro. That's not what we're about. And that struggle is really Ryan Coogler showing you his struggle with America. Yep. But in Marvel form, and Marvel said, we're going to sneak this past them. They're not going to be ready for that. We're going to kind of sneak it past them. And he did the same thing with the second one, because now it's how do you deal with the death of a loved one? And how do you deal with the feeling of revenge? So I'm going to make both characters, Namor, and I'm a big comic book fan. If I can show you my collection over here, we're going to take Namor and Shuri and actually give them the same feelings. But can you learn to trust the person that you hate? And the crazy part is they had every reason to hate Namor. I'm going to kill your mom. I'm going to kill everybody because if it comes to my people, I'm killing everybody if I have to. And told the moms, if I got to come back here, please understand. So neighbor, you got to respect. If I tell you I'm going to kill you when I come back. And then said, 
She brought this on herself. You are now queen. This, this pain is what's going to help you. It is what it is. Basically, bring whatever you're going to bring. Let's go. Now, the problem is, at the end, when she had a chance to offer him, like many of us, we've been taught to just spare. I get it, and I ain't mad at that. But please understand that that's the situation, if we can get to where the real test will come. That's the real Christian test. Can you feed your enemy? Well, Ryan Coogler worked it in, and most people missed it, that he actually gave you a whole scriptural, correct scriptural way. Yield, and I'll let you live when I have every reason to kill you. My question, every man watching that movie, could you, with the man who killed your moms, stand in front of that man, him defeated, and not kill him? Because God said we're supposed to feed him. And the crazy part is, even though he she spared him, what's my man saying at the end? We still going to get the chance to do him dirty because they're going to need us. So, yeah, she spared him. But we can't worry about what God going to do once we do what he tell us to do. And Ryan Coogler, if you go and do any type of research, he quietly positions the spiritual side of himself in everything that he writes. That's why... Chadwick stood out to him because Chadwick never took roles that put him in a position that you saw him in a negative light. Never. And he said, Chadwick just stood out to me. So with Shuri, it was, we had to. He brought back Riri Williams, who had originally applied to be Shuri, didn't work, but he went back and got the sister. And then showed how M'Baku had matured because he said, your brother told me to look after you. Look at the lessons that's actually being taught by Ryan Coogler in the guise of a Marvel movie, but how many of that is missing in our communities? Your brother goes down to a disease. I step in because your brother told me. I'm worried about my son's health, so I sent him to Haiti with his mom and said, don't show up at the funeral. Did your mother know? Yes, she knew. How many of us don't do that and put our child on our front street and have our child in danger? So much so that the sister didn't even know she had a nephew. But he understood the language. He said, but my Wakandan name is. We're not even teaching our children that fashion. You ask my daughter what her middle name is, she will tell you. She's named after her grandmother. Her name is KL. Why? I am big KL, K period, L period. And my daughter is little KL, K-A-Y-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. She's named after me and named after my grandmother. And her nickname is KK. But here's the funny thing. If you call her KK and she didn't give you permission, she'll say, I didn't give you permission to call me that. And she understands that if they say Kaylee, she corrects them. It's KL. Just like when somebody says, hey, Kevin. No, it's key. Because the power of the name is connected to the power of the learning. And Ryan Coogler is quietly showing us things that a lot of people miss because if he makes it too loud, then those that enslave this panic and they want to pull it off the air. So he put it in a Marvel package. But Christians, if you pay attention, it's right there. It's right there. And he showed you. He actually showed you with the story the struggle that most Black men are dealing with. Am I the pacifist or am I violent? Okay, let's give you all the power in the world. Now what do you do? And I'm going to show you powerful women protecting the king. The door Malaje protect the king. They have to sacrifice. And I think the powers that be worked in the LBGTQIA, because that wasn't a thing in the first movie. They worked it into the second one, but that's just Hollywood. They're going to get their, 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 their pint of flesh. It is what it is. But uh, oh boy. sometimes you have to, a sister is the one that wrote this one. The sister is the one that wrote The Protectors of Wakanda. And it's the History and the Training Manual of the Dora Milaje. It was a sister that wrote this one. And then the Wakanda files is actually designed to be able to tell you or give you the whole concept behind what Wakanda is. The thing that's important about when you read books like this is this is where the people who actually create what you're watching have their opportunity to, to show you where their thoughts are. And most people don't even know that it was a sister who came up with the whole concept behind the Dora Milaje so you could actually read what they're actually about. And remember, it's fictitious. So when I can actually put what the fantasy is into what looks like writing, then automatically look at what you're giving to children. Because now when you're giving to children, you're able to show them folks that look like them 
And now you can sit and read with them. And now you can actually, now it's fictitious history, right? But we know that everything that we process with the eyes becomes what? Thought. So I can take fantasy and actually now shape it with reality. And what's the argument that people talk about with the Bible? That it's all fantasy. Okay. Well, fantasy is where most of us start the reality. Some crazy white dudes in North Carolina thought we could try to fly like birds. Well, the Wright brothers got it right. So we have airplanes. And we got a ton of brothers who they thought were crazy that created all type of inventions. So that's the thing right there. And I hope that helps, brothers. Uh, let me put that up there till later. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> Brother Keith, thank you. Thank you so much, man. As always, like I said, we start in one topic and we just go over just yeah. everything. And you, like I said, you just handle it beautifully, man. So appreciate you. Um, thank you, Brother Miles, Brother Mike, Charles. Love you, man. John Joseph. Brother Brother John's all the way. Uh, what is it? You're in um, Houston, right, John? I think. I'm not gonna say Dallas. I think you you're in you're in Houston. So, or you're in now. You're you're in Texas. I know that for sure. So, th thank you, man, for being here, um, brother Rob and my man Landa. As always, man. You know I love you, man. Yeah, I can say your wisdom is major, man. Keep asking them questions. Keep asking them questions. So, no doubt. Um, but yeah. So y'all know, man. This is Truth Talks. Another great. Uh, a session um so many other brothers man they just don't know what they miss um but for sure we got something from it and who was supposed to be here is here Amen. so i thank y'all again man for being here hey bro keep you on mind would, would you pray us out and we'll like i yeah, said sure. go ahead and end this. no problem i appreciate that all right brothers let's be in a mindset of prayer as we talk to the father heavenly father as we come to you collected we ask you that you forgive us for our sins that we have knowingly done and unknowingly done in your sight. And Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to come together as men, to share with each other, to build with each other, to lift each other up. Father, I pray that everything that was shared today was, was positive in your, your sight and that you touch each brother in the way that they needed to be touched so they can take what was shared tonight to those that are connected to them. Heavenly Father, as we stand before you, we appreciate everything that you have presented us and knowing that even our pain allows us to get closer to you because when we get through it, we know that you are on the other side. We know that there is no storm that lasts forever and that you are with us in the storm and there as we come through. Heavenly Father, as we stand with other brothers who may not understand, grant us the clarity, grant us the vision, grant us the words to be able to imprint something onto their hearts and brains that they turn to you for more answers, and we'll be ready to help in whatever capacity that you ask us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. All right, gentlemen. Y'all have a great night. Um, love y'all. Like I said, man, this is Troop Talks, and we'll talk soon. All right, brothers. All right. Be safe Thank out there. Blessings. All have right, a good one. Fellas. God bless, brothers. Excellent.